I'm author and critic David Agronoff. I'm a horror and science fiction author, critic, and researcher. In this podcast, I wanted to provide in-depth interviews and panel discussions with everyone from New York Times bestselling authors to researchers, musicians, and anyone I find interesting. Welcome to Postcards from a Dying World. Hello and welcome to episode 123 of Postcards from a Dying World, this perhaps uh, semi-recognizable voice that you're hearing is uh desmond reddick that's me i'm usually the host of the dread media horror genre podcast uh of which david agronoff has been a guest many many times and uh this is my second time i think no. hosting is it my third it's something <laughs> is it it's my your fourth? fourth time on the on the podcast i've been on the podcast before but i feel like one time you're like okay you're hosting and i was like what it was nightmare so I... city it's right. the same thing Right, we're doing okay. the same thing for right. that book. Yeah. Right, right, right. So that was not that was not my first time on the podcast, though. So no. yeah, okay. Well, I'll here I'll I'll, I'll log this in my resume uh, after we're done here. But uh, yeah, I'm your guest co-host for the week, and uh, and uh, another guest co-host is uh, author of the Long Shalom, Zachary Rosenberg. Hey, Zach. Hey, everybody. Hey, how's, it- how's everyone? Hey, we're uh, very excited to have you here, Zach, to talk about really... this book. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, Des, uh, for people who, if you need to know more, Des, he was on the last <laughs> episode we did about Strange New Worlds, Star, um, Star Trek. Right. He was also mm-hmm. on um, Top 10 Horror Novels with uh, Sadie Hartman and James Chambers and myself. Right from a couple years ago, and this is a good time to pull that one out because it's good for your October reads. But it's always October reads around here, right? One hundred percent. So uh, I thank you guys for coming on, and thank the you reason for having I'm us. turning it over yeah. to Des is because we're covering my book. So yeah, I'm going to let these two guys kind of run the show as far as questions go, because <laughs> you know. There, there. Now, uh, sh- sh- note this, Des. You were the first person to read this novel, right? Right. Yeah, yeah an honor, and uh, I loved it from j- jump. And then, uh, having recently reread it over the past three days, uh, I still love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Now, because my pre-order is not here yet. It's pre-ordered with another book. I can't even remember the name of the book. I can't remember what book it is. That's that's the crazy part. And some oh, well, point in no, in some point in November, I'm going to get an Amazon package with two books in it, and I'm going to be very shocked at one of them. Because you don't remember. What you're I don't about. remember. I guess I could look at my account, but like, uh, so you order two Clash books or just two? No, no, from Amazon. Oh, okay. And and I and I and I guess they've decided that they're going to be shipped together. Which is complicated because as like, Amazon will do. Yes. Yeah. Well, and yes. also that there's just weird issues with like printings of this book. For example, like I I know like for a little while like Clash was sold out of, of oh, it, which is good. That is good. Which is pretty that awesome. Is good. That's pretty that freaking awesome, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, a, a good chunk of the early copies of my uh, novel Mother of Abominations shipped out with like weird mistakes like hey here's chapter nine and instead of chapter nine here's chapter nine again and then after chapter nine here's chapter 10 but it's actually chapter 11 and then the next chapter is 13 it's like oh interesting well that happened to me with uh vegan revolution with zombies but we got it fixed right yeah yeah we we got it yeah we got it fixed we got it fixed too I had one friend who refused to return it, though. She bought a new copy, and she said she was keeping the original because it was a mistake and would be worth more. And I I just let her believe that. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it is what it is. It um, is. But, uh, yeah, so uh, The Last Night to Kill Nazis is um, is available now from oh, Clash Oh, now Clash Books, yeah. 
And so we're what we're going to do first is we're going to talk about it a little bit without spoilers. So um, basically, the way I did on book tour uh, last week, we did a or two weeks ago, we did a Southern California book tour with Cody Goodfellow and cyberpunk legend John Shirley, who Hell yeah. um, was on the last episode of this podcast, maybe. <laughs> um <laughs> because it's recording tomorrow. We are time traveling people. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> he wrote this movie. So that he did. Um, that he did. But uh anyways, um uh we so th- this first part is going to kind of be what we would do uh, for people who have not read the book. So if you've not read the book, you're okay. For the first half an hour, we'll give you a little uh we'll talk about it. We'll give you a warning before we get into spoilers and then we'll t- talk about process. And how the yeah. book is written, just like I do basically on every book and every guest that I interview and have on. Um, and so, because I always want people to be able to enjoy parts of the discussion if they haven't read the book. That's but, right. You know, these two guys, both Des was the first trusted reader for last night before he read it before even Clash saw it. So, uh, um, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, no, 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 I should state here that Des is one, is one of my most trusted readers. So a lot of writers will have what they consider the trusted reader who they can give a book to and will tell them if something is bullshit and will give you an honest opinion. And Des is a person I trust to do that. So um, uh, he's a little nicer than... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Langhorn from uh, the Dickheads podcast, who's one of my other trusted readers, <laughs> who is very mean about it, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I like it, it, I like mean readers. Yeah, yeah. If, if I'm referring to you in conversation, I call myself your alpha reader. <laughs> ah, there you go. Well, hey, that's. Uh, uh, I think that's fair. You've read, uh, as we discussed before we started recording, you've read everything, but like three. Of yeah them. so everything except the stuff that hasn't come out and even then i've read some of that stuff too <laughs> yeah yeah right. you've read um people's park which is the next to come out too, so. hell yeah all right wait for that podcast guys <laughs> <laughs> uh probably next april uh, probably yeah Pro- probably in a different like- probably not in a zoom format either oh yeah yeah we might be able to do that one in person um, might be able to yeah, we'll we'll give people details on that too because they might be able to go too. Uh, but we're here to talk about last night to kill not. Yeah, <laughs> yes, we are. Um, so uh, just jump right in, guys. Um, did All you? All right. Yeah. Um, any initial questions you guys had for me about uh the about this book? So. All right, Des, you mind if I kick off? Yeah, please go. All right. So, David, uh, you know, first off, I think the question on everyone's mind, where'd you get the idea to cross over, you know, Dracula with Inglorious Bastards there? Like, uh, <laughs> you know, like, like, t- like, tell us about, like, the Genesis. Yeah. So um, the thing about The Last Night to Kill Nazis was that um, a friend of the podcast has been on uh, a couple times before, uh, even Zorik, who's one of my uh, uh, best buds from uh, Portland. He and I are big Portland Trailblazer fans, which if um, people don't follow sports, they might not know that that's a basketball team. And uh, at the uh, like pretty much like every night when the Blazers play or pretty often when the Blazers play, like even and I are complaining to each other over instant message um, about the Blazers. And there was one night where we were talking about some movie and he made an offhanded comment about, well, every movie could be made better with a vampire. <laughs> and I was kind of, I laughed at that. And then as I was sitting in my chair, this chair right behind me, um, and I was supposed to be reading, but my mind started going and I started thinking of like 15 or 16, like different movies, like, what they would be like if you added a vampire like and i've already written a screenplay for something that i consider to be um uh i have one called home for the summer that i that i've never done anything with that's like 
the Breakfast Club with Meet mm-hmm. Salem's Lot. Okay. So <laughs> I, um, that's how I, I pitched like that actually um, around for a while. And so I've I've written a lot of vampire stuff before. I have a vampire novel out already called Hunting the Moon Tribe, which is mm-hmm. Chinese vampires. So um, enough so that the singer of Earth Crisis, Carl uh, Bigner, gave me my nickname that I've lived with forever, which is Count Agronoff. Um, so it shouldn't be surprising that I wrote another vampire novel. <laughs> I, they are my favorite monster. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, since? I, since? I, since what? You- your favorite monster since like when when was it solidified i'm just interjecting uh, i'm gonna inter- sorry zach but. no no no, 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 no <laughs> go fine. ahead get there. um <laughs> yeah since hammer movies okay um, all right yeah, so it was christopher you know, lee for you yeah uh yeah. horror of dracula dracula's risen from the grave like twins of evil like um i was a hammer kid we had a cool. horror host in indiana nice. i talked about many times named sammy terry mm-hmm. and um, one of the reasons why Hunting the Moon Tribe happened is that they Sammy Terry was on every Friday at 1130 and then at 130 in the morning was Black Belt Theater and so I used to turn on the you know the the VHS recorder as Sammy Terry was starting in case I fell asleep so I have like I when growing up I had all these double features that were like Dracula's Risen from the Grave and the Five Element Ninjas and um you know, with the horror of Dracula and, um, you know, 10 diagram pole fighter. Right. Like, <laughs> you know, I just, I have all the, I had all these like double features. So hunting the moon tribe was that. Right. Know, yeah. Yeah. Find that. So anyways, even said this thing about, you know, like, you know, any movie would be better with a vampire. And I kind of cycled through a couple in my head. And uh, I've already written World War II Men on a Mission tributes before. I consider Goddamn Killing Machines to be a science fiction version of a a World War II mission novel, which is funny because they're both with Clash and they both have kill or killing in the title. <laughs> and, right, um, right, right. Yeah. And what, what, what's the third book in the kill trilogy going to be? <laughs> yeah, I know. What will it be? Um, I got to think about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, but the funny thing about it is, is so um, I I love World War II mission movies like Guns of Navarone. I like the novels too, the Alistair McLean novels, the Where Eagles Dare, all that. And while I was sitting in my chair, I I didn't even I hadn't even gotten up to go to the bathroom since Ethan said the thing about this. So even will forever be in the lore of this book. <laughs> um, but I just thought to myself. Well, yeah, World War II novel with a vampire, a mission novel with a vampire would be great. Uh, Robert McCammon kind of already did one with a werewolf, uh, Wolf Sour. Yep. But Wolf yes. Sour is more of a spy novel than it is like a mission novel. I mean, it's great. Right. Don't get me wrong. Uh, my werewolf novel, Boot Boys of the Wolf Reich, which is tangentially connected to this world, um, not tangentially it has a it's yeah <laughs> last night actually. it's in it's in universe it's in universe in universe yeah. yeah uh but boot boys has actual easter eggs and references to mccammon's wolf's hour mm. just like the last night to kill nazis has all kinds of nods and easter eggs to f paul wilson's the keep right um, right in it and so i don't shy away from that stuff i mean i was this close to near naming marion in this novel, Ravenwood, uh, right. <laughs> I went with Riverwood, but I ain't hiding what you know. Like, I mean, you're you're fine to picture Karen Allen in that role if you want. Um, sure, sure. Okay, right. now I am. Yeah, <laughs> right. And I'm not hiding that stuff at all. So um, I do that on purpose with fun, pulpy stuff like this. I wouldn't right. do that in a more serious novel, I suppose. Right. But um, <laughs> but in this this one, I had a lot of fun with Easter eggs. But anyway, so I was sitting in the chair and I thought, you know, a World War II mission book with a vampire would be super fun. And then as soon as I thought of the title, um, because I just pictured in my head this Jewish commando picking up the phone in France and then somebody saying, the Fuhrer is dead. You have to go now. You have to kill yeah. as many as you can right now. You have to go. And then he says, well, you know what I need. 
I need the vampire. And that was the concept. That was the, the, the fuse. And as soon as I thought of the title and that phone call, um, I, I was off. Um, and this was the quickest from idea to completed manuscript that I've had in my entire writing career. It was about two and a half months. And I, I just had a window where it's a long story, but, um, and I can't get into too many details, but, um, I had been working on a script for, um, a big, um, uh, Hollywood star who said no to our script. <laughs> and mm -hmm. we were doing a lot of meetings and things. And I had cleared a bunch of time <laughs> to have to do another draft of that. Right. And then, when that guy uh, decided to do a really stupid show for Netflix instead of our um, ah yeah uh, our our movie, <laughs> um, we I had all I had this tiny little bit of space where I had cleared to to work on this, so I wanted to get the novel done quick. So my plan was I did a lot of the research as um I spent basically I gave myself a week to do some hardcore research and then i knew i was going to have to do a lot of research as i was going but the other thing is i know this era really well i know this era yeah. really 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 well so i felt like i would i have a bunch of books on the shelf that were like someday you're going to write a world war ii novel i don't know what it's about i also have a bunch of the, those books for vietnam because eventually yeah. i'm going to write a vietnam novel um and uh so yeah, I mean, I I was kind of ready to go. I I in in a weird way. But um there was one major piece of the research that really changed the direction of the book a little bit and I think without that one piece of research uh it it may not have uh, come together. But and th and that would be um uh the creation of Alice, the character. Okay. Yeah, okay. I I yeah. wanted to talk about Alice, but yeah. Okay, well, well that's that's yeah that's that's the birth of the book right there yeah 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 and that and, and doing the research too was um i mean because i wanted this and except for the landing strip at the eagle's nest that doesn't exist <laughs> in the vampire this could have happened in history right um the details line up and some of these we're gonna have to talk about in spoilers mm -hmm. um but um and we will talk about this in spoilers but um this could have happened <laughs> um yeah you know uh, obviously alice is a creation uh noah Son sonovich is a creation the characters are creations but um the actual historical figures that are in the novel died exactly how they died in the book and um and all that's accurate so um so what I really had to do with that week of research was I had to research that particular night and that particular yeah. day, how the things went down in the bunker, how the Russians, the Russian movements towards, uh, you know, what parts of Germany were still occupied and by whom. So I had to look at the maps and I had to look at um, basically the timeline of the day. What the I looked up the weather. Right, um, right. On that particular day, which so all this stuff is accurate to the actual weather, um, and uh, thankfully it wasn't like a pouring rain day or something that <laughs> messed with the story a little bit. Right, but uh, but yeah, I I had to research all that, and then um, but then but you know Alice was was a big thing in that, so I don't know. We'll get to that. Yeah, when you're ready. But <laughs> well. Well, I think my first note is like the first thing that happens in the book. But first, I wanted to, again, bring up John Shirley, because I believe it's his uh, uh, blurb that calls uh, la the last night to kill Nazis high concept schadenfreude. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So the book opens with Hitler blowing his brains. <laughs> right. Essentially. Yeah. <laughs> but she re it's like, how? <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's like it actually opens. It's like, oh, oh, they're in, oh, they're oh, yeah, okay. Now I get what's happening here. It's like immediate, and then it happens, and it's like very enjoyable. Well, you always want to, <laughs> yeah, you always want to kick off your novel with something like really intense, and um, you always the opening line of novels is really important, and so 
you know, uh, the sentence is he placed the barrel of the pistol against his temple, knowing that he was the most hated man in the world. And um, like, it's interesting because, you know, when I started writing that prologue, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to get to that yucky place right away where you're right inside <laughs> Hitler's mind. And there's so many interesting things about his suicide. The fact that he, um, you know, poisoned his dog. Right. Uh, to make mm-hmm. sure the, the poison was, was going to work because he was afraid Himmler had cut a deal to turn him in. The fact that he got married um, the night before to his mistress um and uh you know it's you know i don't know why he felt like he had to poison blondie i mean i get it he he was afraid he wanted to make sure he was gonna die but like um yeah poisoning poisoning your german shepherd i don't know that, yeah. that's yeah. like it's the final yeah. last act of this horrible man and yeah. um, i'm also also you gotta ask the question wh- what would happen with hitler's dog after hitler was gone well, and that's the thing is he he did think that they were going to parade Blondie in the streets as yeah. like a thing to um because you know uh, the Russians were not kind of peacefully walking into Germany. No, they, no, 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 definitely. That was that was a final mad on is what they had. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, Stalin and, was even saying like, oh yeah, just let them have fun. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And the rush the Russians were not fucking around with it when they came in. And for people and, who and, and the and the fear of the Russians is is palpable through the book. Yes. Th- through yeah. spe- like through you know, through like Alice as well, you know, some other offhand comments and stuff. Yeah. You know, like do you, you know, do you want to be, you know, do you want to be here when they get here kind of shit? Yeah. I mean, there, there, yeah, there, I mean there, there there was even a battle where like you know the German military actually made a last stand just so the civilians could surrender to the uh the Americans and British instead of the Russians. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's... A, yeah, absolutely. And so it's funny because that's, that's a, yeah. Another piece of the novel that comes from the research, you know, um, because, you know, as I kept reading that, like that definitely became like a theme, like the, the fear that, you know, you're going to get caught by the Russians and, and so it's funny because then it's kind of the juxtaposition, but the Russians are the ones you're afraid of, but the Americans are the one that brought a vampire along. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? right. <laughs> you know, but that's partially because, and we'll get into more of, of like Noah's motivation and the fact that Noah wasn't in, involved in like the Nakam plot. And, um, and, you know, one of my favorite things about Noah as a character is how much Himmler knows about him and hates him. And, um, Right. You know, one of my one of my favorite parts of the book is when um, the Nazi double agent tells um, um, uh, Mallory that, um, you know, do you know what they call Noah? They call him the fearsome rat. And um, right. and I just and then he was like, <laughs> and Mallory makes the joke about, oh, Noah would love that. <laughs> would yeah, love yeah that. for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, and I should say some some things about Noah too that's that people might find interesting is that Noah shares um, uh, some ancestry and story with my grandfather um, oh, wow. because my grandfather was a Belarusian Jew who <laughs> was born in Minsk in um, in and came to the United States and uh, ended up in Minnesota at four years old um, just like Noah. And so oh. his story is um, is modeled after my my grandfather, actually. And um, so that's kind of one of the reasons why just randomly it's not random that that Noah um, grew up in uh, Minneapolis, which also, by the way, has um, uh, many, the Twin Cities has a, a, a really large and very active, especially at the time, active Jewish population, maybe more so than today. Um, okay. But at the t- at the time, and I huh. knew a lot about the Jewish community there. So even though I didn't end up using a lot of that, um, there are parts of Noah's background that have to do with him being part of a Jewish family in, in Minnesota that is part of my DNA for the character. Um, mm. And, you know, if enough people buy this book and I write more books about Noah, you, you might uh, learn about that. 
Because oh, yeah. the, the reality is, because I'll tell you guys, if enough people buy these books, I could put Noah in many adventures with every monster imaginable throughout <laughs> the um, like, what, 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 what's happened hunting down escaped Nazis in South America with the creature from the Black Lagoon? Like, let's go. <laughs> um, uh-huh. Absolutely. Uh, well, because you could go forward and back with uh, M- Noah's mummies story. in North Africa. Uh, it's already outlined, sir. <laughs> I bet it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, ghost uh, haunted mansions. I love that. Occupied. See, that's where that's where I would go next. That's where yeah. I would I would do mummies in North Africa. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, and um, the only problem is is that I kind of already sh- uh, used the the werewolves with boot boys. So right. <laughs> uh, that's the only one I'm not touching um, with with Noah, but. Uh, but yeah, and then of course their Nazi hunting days. Um, a, a, a after well, that's a little bit of a spoiler, but yeah, their Nazi hunting days. Um, uh, definitely, I've got like fifteen or so stories in the, in the back of my head for that. But nice. But yeah, I mean, I love Noah as a character. Noah is one of my favorite characters. Yeah, yeah, he's he is great, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, so I would love to see. Um, well, and I also, uh, oh yeah, and uh, Gremlins in the Pacific Theater. Um, <laughs> yeah yeah and uh um and um and bombers uh i've uh, yeah i got that one outlined too <laughs> <laughs> so um uh i've thought about it just a little all bit. right i bet i bet you have. yeah <laughs> <laughs> just a little I'd be, bit i'd be worried if you hadn't actually yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah well and then you know and, and maybe i should um get to the alice thing but but, but like right well, and see, the thing with Alice and why she was such a, a clear and fundamental character is that when I first started outlining it, that um, I didn't have an idea of like who the Nazi POV was going to be. Mm-hmm. And because I kept thinking to myself, well, there's no sympathetic Nazis, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what are you going to do about that? And then in the process of doing the research, I, you know, I just, I watched a lot of like World War II, like, like during that week, like whenever I was like cleaning the house or cooking meals, I'd just throw on World War, last days of World War II stuff um, on YouTube while I was like doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And there was this interview with this woman who had been one of Hitler's secretaries. And this was done in the eighties when she was in her eighties. And she said something about how misunderstood Hitler was. And how he was actually just a really kind man. And like, I just like, I stopped what I was doing and I was like, she fucking nuts. What, you know, what was with this lady? Right. Right. And then I was like, then it just like hit me like a lightning bolt. Well, there's your, there's your Nazi POV. And, um, and we'll talk about this more in spoilers, but, um, but yeah, Alice has a clear arc in the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and uh she was the linchpin of the story once i had her that the whole thing came together Mm -hmm. and you know my belief is i like to have multiple characters and i like to have kind of a rhythm back and forth and i like to have it kind of rhyming between you know like you're gonna get this character here you're gonna get this character here and kind of you know and the, the most um intense example i have of that in my work is ring of fire which um you know has multiple characters and this one there's really only a few povs i mean you did jump you do jump to mallory's some sometimes and marion and and reader yeah and and count writer yeah right is it writer okay it's right i said writer it might be reader like um but um that's just uh you know i went through a bunch of names that were regional and that was okay, yeah picked. and then um and obviously count the count uh the uh the vampire of the story is is um you know his backstory about you know why he hates the nazis they came and took his castles obviously a nod to to the keep mm-hmm. and um but unlike the keep he was actually a vampire yeah <laughs> yes. yeah exactly exactly yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's, 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 he's much nicer than russell um yeah yeah and and by the way the keep is is in my top 10 classic yeah 
and phenomenal book. You, you, phenomenal. you can't you can't do vampires in World War II without you know without tre- treading on the ground that the keep is already tread on you know so I I think it's important to make those nods right yeah also- and I should say that Dr. Wilson I've taken classes from him so right and. Um, he's been on this podcast before to talk about uh, the one of the first episodes of this podcast was Dr. Wilson and I talking about outlining and process, um, yeah. which people should check out because it's just that was a great it's, episode. It's the master of plotting, <laughs> talking, not me, him, you yeah. know, talking yeah. about these things. So, you know, um, yeah, talk, talk about a guy who has like, four series and they're all completely interwoven yeah you know like and like you know series a book book one of one series is like book three of another <laughs> right right so crazy so crazy yeah and then so and then another thing that drove this book was kind of like the you know the timeline i had to and this is another f paul wilson influence which is having it take place in real time hmm. so if you look at the beginning of the chapters and sometimes I gloss over that stuff. Cause I'm just like, you know, when I'm reading somebody else's book, like, I'm like, I don't care what exact minute it was, but yeah, I, always I had to, in this, <laughs> yeah, I had to in this yeah. book because it was a tight timeline and it all, you know, so I was using Google maps to figure out how long it would take at which particular speed to drive between this right. point in France and this point in Germany. And mm-hmm. And I, you know, and I'm, uh, it's great that I had the technology at my hands to do that. No shit. Yeah. 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 But, um, you know, and that comes down to like knowing the weather and knowing what was going on in which cities and, you know, which led to like the interesting scene in, um, in Munich where, you know, the U S forces have already taken Munich, but right. a lot of the Nazis had kind of congealed down into the southern alps at that point and that's you know kind of one of the reasons why you know i had them escaping that way and then um but you know obviously they're you know um you know the nazis didn't really try to escape that way but they were the whole idea of them going to manchuria to set up a new fatherland that was um the plan for for a lot of them so right right you know crazy so there there was one thing that stuck out to me when i was reading the book and this was something that like i really did want to ask about um kind of the idea in a lot of things you have kind of an obsession with like quote unquote the good nazi like oh these people just didn't know what was going on and they would clearly be horrified by it and you know they you know uh, you have like you know the noble soldier and blah blah or the innocent civilian obviously without getting to spoilers there's a lot of subversion of that in that in this book and i was wondering like kind of your genesis of that what you were trying to you know go across there because it was honestly it was really refreshing to see that yeah there's no there's no uh yeah zach you hit the nail on the head there um i i was very worried about the idea of 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 the good the good nazi or the good german and i hate that trope because yeah um <clears throat> You know, and look, I I have, you know, it's hard for me as a person who, for example, is militantly vegan. Like I get this idea, you know, for me being vegan the way I am, a lot of times living in this world, I feel like I'm behind enemy lines all the time kind of thing, just because of like my ethical feelings on on, on those things. And so, um, which I know is a completely different thing. And, um, but in the case of this book, um from the very beginning i wanted to rebel against the idea of good german and obviously there alice is the linchpin of that right yeah because she's the pov character and so we'll probably talk a little bit more about that in spoilers and exactly how we i unfolded that i i don't think it's a spoiler to say that um i would assume that everyone reading this book knows that 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 her journey um is is part of that we're taking on the whole concept of the good german and her and obviously that was inspired by that that interview that i saw with that 
secretary who was obviously right. not in prison that was obviously being interviewed by the BBC and was just like hanging out. Mm-hmm. And that kind of made me sick that this lady was, was out there. And so um, I wanted you to feel in the, I, I will admit it. This is me talking about the strings I was trying to pull. I wanted you to think that Alice was not so bad in the beginning. Mm-hmm. It, it and, actually, it actually kind of worked. You you humanize yeah. her in the first her first couple appearances, and then it sort of creeps back in. It's like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That was intentional, <laughs> right? Yeah, and it works. It works one hundred percent. Yeah, and it, that's one of the things in this novel yeah. I'm I am absolutely most proud of. And when we get to spoilers, we'll talk about the scene that is the linchpin for me on that. And right. it was one that was not in the outline. That was one that kind of came up as I was writing, but um, and then what? basically what happens to Alice in the end and what happens in the epilogue is incredibly important to that arc. And to me is kind of the point, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, like, it might seem like it's tagged on at the end just for some fun, but, um, but Zach, you really hit the nail on the head um, because when I set out to write a book called The Last Night to Kill Nazis, I really wanted the idea that, um, yeah, there's 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 no good Germans here um, in this book. But at the same time, when we did the um, when we did the the book launch event at Mysterious Galaxies, the scene one of the scenes that I read is um, the first scene when Noah kills the teenage soldier at the um, at the uh, um, checkpoint right and yeah. um it was very important. Pa- very powerful scene yeah i'm very proud of that scene and one of the things about that is noah doesn't show any quarter in that scene right yeah. and he knows that that kid is is a manipulated teenager who and and he knows that it sucks that this kid is starving to death on the front lines because the germans don't have any more food to feed him and the Mm -hmm. he's this scared little kid but it doesn't matter at this point no you know after everything he's seen it doesn't matter yeah and what i also wanted was it's it's not it uh, what i like about that scene sorry is that it's not it's not a it was him or me (laughs) no it was he's a nazi and therefore i need to leave part of his head in a little bit of a different place (laughs) yeah (laughs) well and also I didn't want Noah to come off as like this reluctant hero either. Mm. (laughs) I didn't want him to be that. I wanted him to be a pissed off motherfucker. Yeah. Who who is getting revenge and somebody that you could credibly believe would be involved in the, in the knock'em plot, Mm -hmm. which if people don't know what the knock'em plot is, um, was a plan where a group of um, of Jews were actually planning on on poisoning the water in in um, I believe it was Nuremberg, um, and they were calling it a city for a city, and it was like they were going to kill every man, woman, and child in in the city in, in Germany. Now they didn't do it, mm-hmm. but they worked on it. <laughs> right. And, right. Um, and it's a real part of history and it's, it's an, a real ugly thing from the war. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, so Noah having been involved in that is, you know, there's, there's a scene where the, the Nazi uh, double agent says um, like, I know you were involved in that. And, or I know that he was involved in that. And it's one of the things that makes Noah like, kind of a live wire and a serrated edge in this story and one <laughs> yeah. of the things i like about it <laughs> right yeah for sure um and, and i i just you know because and you'll you've seen this because you guys are my friends and follow me online that when you're <laughs> promoting a book with the name the last night to kill nazis there's a lot of yay raw like oh, <laughs> Nazis, great right. yeah i love that attitude yeah <laughs> however I wanted, I wanted people to buy the book thinking they were going to get like a B movie thrill ride Mm -hmm. 
And then they were going to get a much deeper experience when they got in. And obviously, because, you know, I could write, I wanted to write a Holocaust revenge novel for a long time. But, and you could write a deep, morose Holocaust revenge novel, and it's going to be hard to get people to read it. But if you put it in the title, if you say to people like, hey, if you hate Nazis and you love vampires, here's the book <laughs> for you. Yeah. Then you're going to hook them for the fun of watching a bunch of Nazis die. And then you're going to be able to give them a deeper understanding of the generational trauma of the Holocaust mm -hmm. um, that maybe they wouldn't have signed up for otherwise. And, you know, guilty as charged. <laughs> so, um, yeah, because uh, and, you know, and part of the way into that is Count Ryder's ability to exploit the guilt you know, like any vampire would to get, you know, a Dracula uh -huh. style vampire who can mm -hmm. get into the minds of his victims and manipulate them. Yeah. And by seeing the events um, that, you know, and the things that they carried out. So, you know, once he starts taking off victims, it's not just that he's killing Nazis, it's that he's like exposing their crimes and using their guilt against them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, those know. those are some of the like the funnest kills you know like it's like yes. much less carnage and more you know you think that you're you know the wife you betrayed is talking to you or whatever you know until you know until it's too late yes you know that's yeah. good shit <laughs> yeah and i'm proud of that stuff because i think that's stuff that people you know i <laughs> hope that once more reviews start showing up online it's like People are going to say like, whoa, this is way deeper than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> that was really my react. I mean, that that was definitely one of my reactions. It was right. like, well, holy shit, this this is really saying something. Mm -hmm. Well, thank yeah, you. Sir. It, it, yeah, it's 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 got the pulpy B movie fun, but it's also yeah, it is it is saying deeper things, and it's saying it in a serious way. And it's saying it in a well-researched and, uh, you know, true way, except for like the made up characters and the vampire. That vampire in particular was not in World War II. He's just one that David made up. Yeah. <laughs> that particular one. That yeah. particular one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So before we get into spoilers, is there any other questions that you want the general to things specifically you want to talk about with the book for people who have not read it yet? Who maybe have not committed. I would just say, absolutely the hell read this book. It is great. <laughs> well, thank you, yeah. sir. I'm I'm nodding emphatically. It, it's it's a very fun read. I've read it twice, <laughs> and I'll read it a third time when I actually get a copy of the book. <laughs> but uh, it's a it's a really it's a really fun novel. And yeah, it says it says more than just you know Nazis having their heads ripped off. But it also has yeah. that. But it does, and yeah, <laughs> and we need more of that, especially these days. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. It, it was basically told to me it's like, hey, would you like to do like a, a like a Jewish horror book from a Jewish writer about you know like vampire about a vampire in World War II? I was like, yeah, with that title, sign me up for sure. Mm -hmm. And and I should say that um, I'm not um, I'm not a practicing Jew. Um, oh, no. I'm a I'm a secular person, but uh, <laughs> don't worry. Uh, I come, I come, my father was about as uber Jew as you could get. <laughs> so like, and, and honestly, and I will tell you guys in relation to my father. Well, that, that's how Zach grew up too, right? Yes. Yes. I did grow up. Uh... No, sorry. Oh, God, I didn't <laughs> actually, I'm sorry, Zach. I didn't even mean to say Zach. I meant to say Noah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I was, I mean, I was, I was saying, you know, like I grew up, uh, my family uh... wasn't. My, my my family was more reformed growing up. Like, you know, we had all the holidays. There was never a Christmas tree or anything. It was, yeah. you know, like, or on Hanukkah, go to temple for Shabbat sometimes. I would, but like, you know, I've gotten more and more into it as I've grown older. Sure. Right. Well, and for me, um, you know, my father passed away in 2019 and that I think, you know, he did everything super traditionally, you know, and, and like the burial and, uh, you know, we did, you know, um, Sat Shiva and you know like like right. his he was very involved with his synagogue in in Indiana and there's not a lot of Jews in Bloomington so you know it, right. it's kind of a tight-knit community and and so um I think having gone through that with my father just before writing this book um 
was part of the power of the experience. Um, and, uh, you know, I, you know, do think that it connected me to that part of my heritage in, in a way. And, um, you know, uh, it's a, it's a terrible, uh, reflection on the, the state of the issue of anti-Semitism, but, you know, uh, there's that saying, like, um, I'm Jewish enough for Auschwitz. Um, and unfortunately that, oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. And that, that's a thing is that the trauma of the Holocaust, something that people who aren't connected to Judaism, like when you, and I'm sure it's the same thing with, you know, African-Americans who like see movies about slavery and stuff. There's like a generational, like when you're a kid, you can't get away from thinking like that could have been me if I was born at a different time. And, right. 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 And that's, um, you know, one of the things that is kind of like, uh, I think part of the motivation of writing this book, but you know, yeah. Um, well, it's, it's not like the Nazis were rounding up Jews just at synagogues, you know, like it's, not, it's not like that was the case. Right. It's not right. like if they didn't practice, they'd be OK. They went after everybody. Right. Right. No, it was very much defined as a very strong, um, you know, like they very, very racialized. Like if you had a Jewish, I, I, I can't remember the exact like co-sanguine line, King Sing, but you had people who were practicing Christians who were, you know, rounded up with everyone else. Mm -hmm. in yeah. Yeah, because they were they were um, uh, uh ethnically jewish and or like connected family wise and so on and so forth yeah absolutely yeah yeah well we know the holocaust wasn't also just jews so yeah yeah that right. mind too uh, right you know gypsies and Say, disabled romani yeah lgbt yeah oh, yeah almost yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it was, one of the reasons i was actually going to say was because like i really love the no good you know nazi line there's always a picture that stuck with me you know like very much and it's the very famous one of the staff some of the staff on auschwitz on their day off when they're like, you know, um, just posing for the camera and laughing and smiling. And honestly, I just find that like one of the most fucked up images I've ever seen. Yeah. Well, yeah. this is in the book, but uh, Himmler's um, motivation for coming up with the death camps was that he was so bothered that his soldiers had to go through the trauma of shooting 100 Jews in, in Belarus um, and that he was worried about their trauma from mm. from and that's that's a real that's a real thing that right a motivator for himmler and the, and you know i had to there's a there's a couple chapters that are directly through himmler's eyes in this book and yeah that was that was really icky yeah that was really icky research um and 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 icky writing but um but yeah, so maybe this is a good time to get into spoilers. Do we have any, anything else you guys want to say before uh, we get into spoilers? Spoiler warning? I th yeah, I, th I think we can jump into spoilers. I think I'm ready for that. Yeah. All right. So now that now you guys can really grow me because we're talking process <laughs> now. All right. Um, so we're in spoilers. So um, we're assuming at this point you either have read this or don't give a shit about having it's spoiled we're going to talk about the process of writing this book and we're going to talk about nitty-gritty details of why certain decisions were made mm -hmm. as we always do on this podcast when we cover a book in depth <laughs> right right Dad, so, yeah, first question yeah when you when you first drafted this how long how long from zero to finish book from idea to completed manuscript was um, about three months. Wow. And that's okay. the quickest I've ever gone. <laughs> I, a ring of fire was like 13 years. So, um, you know, uh, it's not a super long book, obviously, but yeah, um, but yeah it was fairly quick. And wow. got two and a half months, if you don't count the research, it just happened to be in a window. I was coming up on a vacation from work. So I was able to knock out the first like 40,000 pages over a two week vacation. Nice. And uh, 40,000 words, you mean? 40,000 words. The first 40, <laughs> yeah. 40,000 yeah. pages is a big book. <laughs> yeah. 
Do I look like Alan Moore to you? Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, 40,000 words. Yeah, the first 40,000 words or so I did over a vacation, um, which for me, that's well, a lot of times with the vacations is when I, uh, when the vacations from work, I don't, you, I sometimes go on trips, but that's to work. Um, right. Like the second draft of this, I the 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 polish I did on the script, I did on the train to Portland back and forth with the sleeper car, which was awesome, and nice. I highly recommend that um, process for because I was just going to get a cabin in the woods, and my wife said, "Why don't you just take the train to Portland and do it on the train, and then you can go have pizza with John Shirley," which was what I did. <laughs> I basically nice. had pizza with John Shirley and turned around. And then um, <laughs> and came back. Um, essentially, I was absolutely in Portland. And even I hung out with even and Jeff Burke. That was it. <laughs> so I saw like five friends and then turned around. Um, but I, uh, yeah, it was about three months. It was quick. It was really quick. Um, and honestly, I was worried that it was going to suffer for it. But man, I was in the fucking zone with this one. And I'm not, <laughs> not to pat myself too hard on the back but I was in the fucking zone and um, I knew what the hell I had on. I knew this idea was, was gangbusters. And I knew once I had Alice figured out, once I had that hook um, and knew I, I, I had done a version of the outline without her and that I wasn't excited about. And when I went back and outlined it with her, I just started over on the outline. I didn't keep okay. any first outline. And once I outlined it with her, I was good to go. And I literally started two days later because vacation was, I was like four days before vacation. So I started, I started a couple of days before vacation and what I, I work, I have a three minute bike commute to work. And what I do is for my writing process is I get up, I set my alarm for five 30 and I get up and I write, I have to be at work at eight 30 and I write in the morning before I leave for work, um, right. which is currently what I'm doing on a science fiction novel right now. And um, I morning is my favorite time to write. And <laughs> if I'm, and then Sundays, I usually write all day unless I'm recording something like this. And then um, Saturdays I don't write, but then um, I very rarely write in the evening. I usually just write in the morning if I can. And then when I'm on vacations and like I was doing for this book, I was, getting up at like six or seven o'clock and then just writing until like three or four, taking a nap and then having an evening. So, wow. and that was, and there were times though in that first 40,000 and when I was kicking the ass on this book and even when I went back to work during that where I was working, I was writing all, all night too. I was just like, I'm going to finish this book. And anybody who knows me knows I'm a big basketball addict and nerd. I love playing basketball i play basketball three times a week we have three runs that we play in ob here where it's like dudes just show up and we make teams and we play and and like i don't miss basketball for very much <laughs> <laughs> um like i love playing basketball i'm from indiana so deal with it uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> the home of basketball basically and I actually was skipping basketball where my friends at basketball were like, dude, where were you on <laughs> Monday and Wednesday? Because I was kicking so much ass on this book. Right. I was uncharacteristically not going for runs, not doing exercise. I just like slammed through this book. So yeah, that was uncharacteristic for me. got to capitalize on it when you can, right? Man, I was feeling it. I was feeling it hard for <laughs> You were too. in yeah. the zone. Yeah. yeah. That so, always feels so good. <laughs> it always feels so good. When you like look down, you're like, oh shit, I wrote that much. Yeah. Like it's like almost blacking out, you know? It's great. <laughs> yeah. And it should be noted too that at this time, like also I was working with a producer. We came close to um buying the rights to uh, a classic science fiction trilogy that I love to adapt. And we had networks interested in it, but we couldn't get the rights from the, um, from the author. Uh. And, but we had, we <laughs> thought we were a go for that. So I had a lot of energy because I thought that was going to go soon. So right. I had to finish this. 
quit. Yeah, you were. You, yeah, right, right. Or something that did not happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which was with the same producer who our right. script. Pro- That's the thing about when you're doing screenwriting stuff is, ninety nine percent of it doesn't happen, and yeah. you know. Um, but it was funny. Well, I I just listened to an interview with Ben David Grabinski. Oh and, yeah, and he was writing scripts for like eleven years before anything ever got made. Yeah, exactly. And well, and I will be thankful that that project didn't go, but I will be thankful that it was there because that's the reason why I pushed myself so hard to finish this book so quick. Right, is because I thought you know there was a chance that this big sci-fi thing we were doing was was gonna go. And, um, you know, it didn't, but that's okay. Um, uh, we, we still have the script in case, um, <laughs> you know, he changes his mind, but, um, but, you know, in the, in the end, you know, I just, I, I was working very, 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 very fast on this one. Yeah. No kidding. It, 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 it paid off. Now the, the, honestly, it felt very well cared for. Yeah, yeah, and it, I didn't feel rushed either, but I just just felt like in in the zone. So it was great to have a deadline, and, and but um, but you know, a lot of that comes in that I did put a lot of work into the second draft. Yeah, um, all the bones were there, but um, and that was after Christoph read it, and and it's funny because Christoph at Clash. He had a lot of structural changes he wanted me to do um, uh, on uh, goddamn killing machines. But on last night, uh, basically, um, you know, all the changes that we made were were, were minor, you know, um, for the most part, like mm-hmm. most everything was um, what was was solid. And it's funny, too, because and and maybe this could have gone in the non spoiler part, but, you know, when I first called Christoph and said, I have a novel to pitch to you. His first response to me was, I don't, we don't have any time in our schedule. Like we're packed with authors. I don't really have time for a pitch right now. And I said, just let me tell you the title. (laughs) Perfect. And and here we are. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And it was important to me that Lisa and Christoph both have Jewish, that Jewish backgrounds too. That was one of the reasons why I went to them. Mm-hmm. you know uh yeah. from from the beginning like and i knew Christoph. i i know Christoph well enough to know that he was going to get this idea from the beginning <laughs> and so like i mean i never had anyone else in mind for this book from the minute i thought of it um so cool. from from beginning to end he was going to be my editor on this one or we might not be if he had said no, we might not be talking about this book at all. <laughs> I'm glad we have it. So, you know, there, there's like a big spoiler question I wanted to uh, tackle while we're here. Like, this is where yeah. like, hey, spoil, spoil the ending, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we can talk about the ending, but um, maybe we want to get into Alice first. Yes, um, well, it, that is kind of what I was going for. Okay, yeah, go ahead and ask. So, how did you like, you know, how did you feel about like the setup with, um, you know, kind of the reveal about alice there the culpability the fact that she was like you know this idea that like even the people who are you know civilians are these willing accomplices in genocide well yeah my very favorite part of the book is involved with the reveal of her arc um and that's what i was talking about in the sense that this wasn't planned um Mm. so there's a scene where the because the thing is that in the beginning i wanted alice to be like where you think that you know because very much the way alice is looking in the beginning it's like she's in the bunker but you know she doesn't fully understand everything that's going on she's what is a secretary gonna know well anyone who ever works in any institution knows that the secretary fucking runs the place runs the place right if you have a bad secretary it sucks (laughs) <laughs> if you look closely at what everything that she's saying, it's all there that yep. she's a person. But in her head, mm-hmm. she doesn't see herself as evil. She doesn't see herself as a part of the war machine. She just sees herself as I got mixed up with this SS officer <laughs> while we were like terrified in the bunker and he knocked me up. And now I've got to get, I've got to. I got to get through this so my boy can live. 
mm-hmm. and he had nothing to do with this war. And, you know, there's some weird implications that you could make about the child's right to life in there. <laughs> right. That um, I don't, I don't know. I kind of saw it as writers, Count Ryder saw the child as innocent, but not her. And um, yeah, there's some weird implications there, but um, that was more for story. And I'm not really going to get deep into that. But what the the whole good German thing with Alice and my favorite scene, probably my favorite scene in the whole book is when they first arrive at the um, Eagle's Nest and they're, they're, they go and they sit in the chairs that she and Hitler had sat in together. And right. all I had on the outline was Alice sits in the chair and she's not tall enough for her feet to hit the floor. That's right. Okay. Said. Right. And then <laughs> I started writing about her and I was like, okay, so wouldn't it be interesting as I was writing, I was like, wouldn't it be interesting if she had sat here with the Fuhrer, right? Mm-hmm. And then I was like, well, in her role, as the way it's described in the book, she was mostly doing letters. She didn't do much of the speeches, but her job was to do letters. And that, and that came from research that he had a separate secretary who just did letters and whose job it was all day was to read through Hitler's letters and see which ones she thought he should respond to. Mm-hmm. And, but then I had this idea that as I was writing, it just came up to me like, well, what if the crux of her, you know, what if she in this spot dictated one of these speeches and there's a scene where she's typing up the speech for the Fuhrer and the Fuhrer says, you know, I'm committed to the destruction of the Jewish people. And then Alice says, no, my Fuhrer, say race, don't say people. And when I wrote that, there was no plan. Oof. I just, and, and the hairs on the back of my neck just stood up. Yeah, it's one of my favorite parts in the book. <laughs> it is my favorite part of the book. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. It was um, like, oh, you fucking bitch. <laughs> oh, like, oh, God damn it. Yeah. Well, and I went, and I, after I thought of that, I was like, he had to, did he say Jewish race or people? And I read a bunch of his speeches and he always said race. Right. He never said the Jewish people. He always said the Jewish race. And I found one specific didn't want speech. them to think, be thought of as people. Right. Yeah. And, and so there was one particular speech where I stole the text for that. There is one actual real speech that okay. I used that was the one that he was dictating to her. And, um, and I used the actual words from Hitler's speech, and he he definitely said Jewish race in there. But, um, but to me, that is that's my favorite moment of the whole book because that's that's the concept of that's like breaking down the concept of the good German in one moment. You know, yeah, is because we've been with her like fearing for her uncle de- being dead in Munich and seeing the bombing, and we've seen her afraid of the Russians and we've seen her like react to watching um, you know, the other Nazis get killed for questioning what was going on. And we've seen lots of different aspects of her, but, and then it sets up up for the epilogue and that's what you were asking about. I think Zach. Mm -hmm. And and for the epilogue for me, it was really important that Alice didn't get away. Um, That you think Alice got away And she got away because Ryder let her go and have the child. And Mm -hmm. that it was important to me in the end that Ryder make the decision that once Alice was gone, he could die in peace because he had served his mission. Yeah. And I really liked the idea of Ryder like watching the sun come up and, and dying. And like he and kind of a fat older Noah, you know, who have spent, decades at this point hunting nazis in south america with the creature from the black lagoon obviously um you know (laughs) that 
you know, this was the end of their mission. The last thing was was to get Alice. Yeah. Now, of course, how they get Himmler too is is important, and that was matching up the history because, um, Himmler died. Well, because when I was writing this, I wanted Himmler to be the ultimate villain, but he couldn't die on the mountain because he actually died in Belgium. So right. He had to get off the mountain. So then I liked the idea that he was so evil that Ryder couldn't even, there was no soul for him to invade. And that was a great touch. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and that's how he got off the mountain and how he got to Belgium. Now, here's the other thing is Alice's um, boyfriend. Um, Heinrich? Heinrich? Heinrich. Uh, Heinrich. Yeah, Heinrich. Um, well, yeah. so that is the actual name that his name is the actual name that was on the ID that Himmler had in his hands when he was arrested. Oh, really? Yes. That was the actual name. And so I probably wouldn't have had him have the same name <laughs> as Himmler if it was right. up to me. But yeah. um, the idea that Alice's SS boyfriend was the ID that Himmler had on him was, is a detail that most people are not yeah. going to notice went right over my head. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's great. That's great. Little Easter, Easter egg there. Yeah. That's real history. That was the actual name that was on his ID when, and that's also another one of my favorite moments in the book is, is um, when, cause he died from taking cyanide. Right. And I love the idea that Noah is there and actually pushes the cyanide tablet across the table. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I, fuck i want i could that was in my head from the very beginning um and that was the scene i just could not fucking wait to get to yeah. because um i love this idea that he's like oh look the sun's coming up or the sun's going down sorry the sun's going down and he looks at himmler and he's like and then pushes the pill across and is like make a choice it's either this pill or my guy but yeah. you're you're and it also <laughs> that that Noah gets the um, the uh, joy of killing Himmler because that was right. That was the guy that Noah wanted to get, you know, and head of the head of the SS. Yeah, yeah. And that for me, the ultimate thing in this book was going to be uh, <laughs> was going to be Noah actually being the one that killed Himmler. And since we know he died from from ingesting poison, then. The only way Noah could do it was if he poisoned him. And then the idea that he gives him this choice and pushes the pill across that um, was great. Yeah. And that was a scene that was one of the first scenes in my head. Like when I outlined the book, like I wrote that scene in the outline pretty much first. <laughs> okay. You know, like, so, so that brings up, that brings up a question then. So did yeah. you, sorry, what did you write first again? That last scene? Yeah, it was one of the first scenes because Okay. Sorry, I, first... I, I was I was gearing up to ask the question, didn't realize you actually answered the question. I was gonna ask if if you go from beginning to end. Normally I do. Normally okay. I do, but um that night, that first night when I thought of the book, um you know, I, I made the decision that Himmler was gonna be like the the Himmler was gonna be the villain. And then when I did research, when I started doing research and I saw and I saw the whole thing about the Belgium camp that he made it as far as Belgium and that he had this fake ID. As soon as I saw the fake ID, I had already watched the thing and already kind of came up with the idea for Alice. And then immediately I was like, Oh, well that ID is Alice's uh, baby daddy, you know? And right. um, that's obvious. And so then I knew that. And then I just, I knew I wanted and I knew Himmler was going to die from the poison. So I wrote down before I even started plotting the whole thing. I wrote, I wrote that, you know, Noah was going to give the pill to Himmler yeah. and give him the choice. Like you can either face my vampire. Or... I was, or... I knew I wasn't going to have him say that. I just wanted him to push it forward, but I had that scene from the beginning. And then nice. my, my outlining process generally is scene by scene. And what I do is, um, I'll usually sit with a notebook starting on paper and I will like sit in my reading chair, which can, 
there's my reading chair. <laughs> I usually sit there with a notebook and um, I'll, you know, write a little thumbnail and then I'll, I'll, you know, I don't number the chapters, but I do like, you know, and I started with Hitler shoots himself. Um, <laughs> cut to Alice POV, you know, and then the next chapter, Noah gets a phone call waking him up. You know, Noah goes to talk to French resistance. Noah goes to meet the generals. Noah does, you know, or whatever. Yeah. And I just put little thumbnail points and they're usually super short. And that's why I get annoyed when like you know, Stephen King or Joe Hill like will say that that outlining is soulless because like things like the Alice scene, that wasn't in my outline. I just used that because, you know, it's it. I think it's a position of privilege that writers who don't have day jobs and don't have other things to do in their life. It's easy for Stephen King to say like, you know, I can write without an outline because he knows the next day he's going to be able to get to it. Where a lot of right. times, like when I'm writing a book, like it may be like three or four days between I get a shot to write at it. So I need an outline to keep me on track. So I remember mm -hmm. where I want to go. And I basically, when I'm outlining, I run it like a movie in my head. And then I just write down the bullet points. And if there's something that I'm like, oh, that's really good. I got to, I got to make sure to hold on to that. Then I will. Right. And, um, but yeah, so that, that, that's the thing. So, um, but yeah. And then, you know, so that, that's part of process for outlining but um but the actual creation of the book when you get down to it there's still a lot of discovery there's still a lot of you know getting the soul of the story by um you know you, you know you're going to discover parts of it um right you know. right i didn't for example i didn't plan i knew i wanted you know i kind of i this idea that i wanted the daughter of van helsing you know, to be with them, to be their vampire expert. But then I like the idea that she said she was that so she could get to Europe. Right, right. <laughs> to avenge her father. And then just when I was sitting there, I was like, well, I need a name for her. And in my head, I just saw Karen Allen. And then I was just like, all right, you're Marion <laughs> Riverwood. <laughs> right, right, right. And I just was like, and that was a kind of a placeholder. And then I just I was like, you know what? I like that. I don't give a well, shit what anyone thinks. I, I do love it. I wouldn't call it a scene, but it's sort of like an offhand aside where it's like, well, we've got our expert here. And she's like, expert. I didn't even fucking think it was real. I just came to Europe, you know, with my dad. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then, yeah. And there's some interesting moments with her the first time she has to kill someone, yeah. and then, you know, and, uh, you know, and that's another example of discovery, um, uh, Mallory's backstory. And it was funny because at one point, um, so one of the things Clash does is they have a, um, they'll have somebody like Christoph and I went through the book together and then they'll have somebody just do a grammar check, you know, like they'll mm -hmm. have another pair of eyes do grammar check. And the person who did the grammar check wanted me to cut Mallory's backstory weirdly because that really the person who's doing the grammar check is really just supposed to be looking for grammar and not like making story suggestions right but this this editor wrote me and said that i don't think you need this um backstory with mallory and i was like well i disagree <laughs> i really need this um and part of it the thing that i loved about the backstory with mallory was that he had survived the blitz right and that right. he had you know that and that's kind of a, a an homage or easter egg to the character mallory from the navarone books is because they they always hired actors to play mallory who were excessively old to play right. a soldier in world war ii and right. so that always bugged me but i never you know i love those movies and so I was answering in my own head canon why a guy who's old enough to have fought in World War I was so crucial in World War II. And the <laughs> idea that he was a veteran of World War I, but then after the Blitz was like, I got to make sure my boys don't have to fight in this war, that it ends before they have to go off to it. 
right they never experienced so- and that was really powerful to me so when the the editor was the the proofreader was like, I think you should cut this. I was like, well, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's, it's, good thing with Christoph totally got it. And Christoph right. was like, yeah, no. Right. <laughs> and back it, he was like, no. It's, it's, it's funny you say that because um, tomorrow, yeah, it's Sunday today. Tomorrow's episode of Dread Media uh, where I th- – throw throw out a big shout out and a recommendation for the last night to kill nazis and uh do a review of brooklyn 45 a new film from ted goff again on shutter and then do my top five favorite horror war mashup genre movies but brooklyn 45 the major problem i have with it is it takes place in brooklyn in 1945 with a group of world war ii veterans who like the youngest one of them is played by larry fessenden like they're all like in their 50s even like late 50s oops yeah Yeah. i'm like how like why did you not just make this like a 15 year reunion like why not make it brooklyn 60 or here brooklyn 55 even you know i was like (laughs) it bothered me so much i'm like there's no way that these people did the dirty in world war ii because they were they are of the age to be telling people to go do the dirty (laughs) right you know yeah yeah no no and that's that that and that was that was the thing with because i I, I wanted Mallory to be older to be homage to those movies, but right. I needed an excuse. And then I liked the backstory with him. And, and um, you know, one of the things you have to do with this book, with The Last Night to Kill Nazis, is if you're going to do a World War II mission book with a vampire, is you have to combine the tropes of the vampire with the tropes of the World yeah. War II mission. And one of the most interesting you know, like one of the things is in all the World War II mission movies and books, there's the character who um, betrays them, who's the double double agent who right. betrays them. And that in this case, it was Eva, I believe her name was, who's uh, yep. a Nazi. Yeah. And um, she and her, yeah. <laughs> and she's the first vampire kill. And so that's where you cross the tropes. Oh, right. 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 Yeah. So she's the first. And so that I was really proud of, of, and that was from the outline and setting up and the structure of the story is that I set her up to be, to be betraying them right at the moment when the sun goes down and Ryder comes out and is hungry and needs, (laughs) you know, so I am very proud of the timing of the hut. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Because you were working on an actual pretty, pretty strict timeline there. Yeah. yeah. And so to me, that's, you know, and I like doing that stuff like the vegan revolution with zombies, like, um, you know, every zombie movie has to have the guy who hides the bite and right. like turns inside that thing. And and in the vegan revolution with zombie, that was the freegan. Right. You know, who's, <laughs> who's um, eating non-vegan stuff uh, because he thinks <laughs> because he's a freegan. And I don't know that most people get like not pat myself too hard in the back how genius a version (laughs) of that trope is right right and so um that i'm really proud of the fact that the first vampire kill comes with the double agent with that moment with that reveal and partially because um they set where like noah knows what's happening and basically sets up the moment and noah's behind it Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. like, so I'm. Really- Although the others don't know. That's another favorite part of the novel for me is like when he comes out and it's like, oh, he's probably hungry. We didn't think about that, did we? You know? <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's right. what I mean with the tropes right there. Right. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, so, so you, so there's all kinds of fun moments like that where you get to, to do that. And, and, um, you know, and the idea that the thing that they're carrying across the border in this casket is a vampire, but then we have the whole scenes where they're like, um, you know, having to cross the checkpoint. And they're like, oh, it's a hero of the fatherland and we're returning right. the ferry. And I'm proud of that moment because that also has the whole thing. Oh, like he's an Algerian is a common mistake. When they yeah, yeah like, and like, 
talk you about know, tropes, right? Talk about tropes. You need to have that. Yeah, that and that tense sets up checkpoint thing, right? The, right. Yeah, that the, sets up the first Nazi kill, right? Which is Noah's, which we talked about earlier, which is like you know the fact that he's so vicious about it, and I also like how Marion is like worried. And then they hear the gunfire and Mallory knows which gun it is. Right. <laughs> like, no, no, it's fine. That was a Beretta. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm proud of a lot of the little it kind of details in this one. Like, um, you know, I, I, if, I feel like they're really well handled. And something that happened at, at the first book release party is I have a friend who's like a huge history nerd and like um, who fact checked me and said that I because I said something about there's a scene where I said where the whole the maps of the world got reshaped in six years. And that's like one of the lines that I read in it. And he was like, well, the war didn't last six years. That's incorrect. And then I, I got like really flustered and I was like, and I thought to myself, did I get that wrong? But I wasn't reacting to, I was reacting to from the invasion of Poland right to the end of the war. Right. that was six years yeah so mark called me out and he was wrong yes <laughs> because i was like i couldn't possibly have gotten that so wrong there um, there's a there's a lot of americans who think that world world war ii only lasted four years <laughs> right <laughs> no and, offense you guys <laughs> nope, not taken. Yeah. well that's true and um but yeah um but yeah, so uh, any other things on the on the on the composition of it? I'm sure you got questions. Come on, hit me. I'm trying to come up with something oh, here. I'm trying, to, <laughs> trying to think of one right now. Um, okay, I, you know what? I I, I got one. I, I I got I got I got a last one. How much See, fun was it? This to... is your chance, Zach. <laughs> yes. Any questions? How much fun was it to write the vampire attack scenes? Well, yes, they were a lot of fun. I think the one that we talked about just before was probably the most fun because that was the one we were building up to. Um, right. The uh, the I once they got into the eagle's nest, that that was a lot of fun. I think the one with the two soldiers who end up killing each other under right. Ryder's direction was probably one of my favorites because that's the one where he's exploiting the trauma they have over the woman that they hid under their bed. Right. Right. And that was so fucking evil that, yeah. um, like, and I really, that wasn't really in the outline. I just, you know, I think I said in the outline, like he, he, um, he exploits their crimes, you know, to, to, to cause them to right. hurt on each other. And then I thought, well, what if, and then what my thinking in that was that they had to have done something that they both felt different levels of guilt about, but where maybe they would both blame each other. And then right. I don't really know. I mean, and a lot of the horrible things that the Holocaust scenes are all just things I read about in research. And I did read about, a case that was similar to that and that was bad and then there's a nazi kill with uh the woman that ran the french consulate and she was a really funny character for me too because i wanted her to be like this and she was kind of inspired by having watched army of shadows which is the oh, okay here melville which everyone should see and i covered on this podcast as part yeah, of our great. build up to this um it, it's uh here's how i would pitch it to most people who would never watch a melville movie it's like andor set in world war ii <laughs> <laughs> because um because, because i've told Bro, they that, totally ripped off andor for this yeah well, because i tell people that andor is army of shadows right Star Wars, so that's the way <laughs> but yeah so i read about this woman who killed a bunch of um student dissidents in France and she ordered the the killing of a bunch of student dissidents in France. And then I had this idea of her like in, looking Sp at... in Spain, do you mean? No, it was in uh, Spain. France. Oh, okay. In sorry. Occupied France. Yeah. And she was like 
she was basically the secretary for the occupation commander of France or whatever. Right, uh, right, commandant. right. And she was particularly, this was a real woman, and she was particularly known for being brutal as fuck under this, like, French occupation. And so I wanted her to go and I wanted her bad. And then I just had this picture in my head of her like sitting there smoking a cigarette in the kitchen. She has a scene with Alice right before it happens. Right. Where she basically is like, oh, we're fucked. Yeah, we did this. <laughs> right. And yeah. we're guilty as fuck. And then and and like whereas Alice is still trying to convince herself she's not so bad. I I just really like the idea of this woman just like being like, you know, oh no, no. We're yeah, terrible. yeah, yeah. We we brought this on ourselves. We brought yeah. this on ourselves, and so when it when it kind of comes, that's to another her, great moment. Yeah, and um, and you know, yeah, and so with the vampire kills, like, yeah, I did have fun with those, but you know, in a weird way, and this is something that only a horror writer could understand, is that um, uh, it's weird to really have fun and have be really excited about when you're highlighting the most awful shit. Right. right? And, right. but the mission of this book was to, you know, right before I started writing this, not just um, my father's death, but, you know, I live in San Diego. The, the synagogue shooting in Poway was, yeah, you know, right. I mean, uh, my stepbrother and, my uh and his wife have you know gone to that synagogue you know and um and you know they're very active in the jewish community here and so you know i've talked to them about that so you know the the anti-semitism in this community right here in san diego was Mm -hmm. was raw and fresh so i know it sounds silly and weird to say that it's going to sound weird to anybody who's never done this but when you nail a scene that shows how horrific and awful something like this is, when that's your mission of the book in a weird way, that's more satisfying than um, the vampire kills. And in in a weird way, because like when I can look at a scene and say like, Oh no, that's fucking awful. Mm -hmm. That really shows how awful that is. Right. Um, In a weird way. Um, if I can make myself uncomfortable when I'm writing it, when I can be like, Oh, Oh, that's bad. But then the chapter's over. And then I can look back and be like, yep. That's there good. We go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did it. Um, and that's why that scene with Alice, when she corrects the Fuhrer is, is a moment that I'm so proud of because like, you know, I mean, honestly, the scene that was the most fun was Himmler with, with right. the pill. That yeah. that there's that I was so looking forward to that scene, the whole fucking book, you know. It's so good. Yeah, yeah, and and I knew how good that scene was, and I wondered to myself sometimes when you're thinking like Quentin Tarantino, like when he was writing the um the French farmhouse scene in Inglorious Bastards, he yeah. had to mm-hmm. know that is yeah. something. That, I am writing the scene. fuck out of this shit. And it yeah. rules, and it's so good. Um, I, I I've said since I first watched that movie that that's something they're going to be doing at like an acting school for decades to come. It's, it's a fantastic fucking scene, and also yeah. real just shout out to how that movie tackles a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's exactly. like the only it's it's like the only movie you know just like to link it together. It's like the only movie that's done like uh, oh the Jewish girl Nazi quote unquote romance in any sort of good and inoffensive manner right yeah and so for me the same thing that the the pill scene with himmler was i knew that ruled yeah Um, (laughs) and and i'm i'm not going to be humble about that at all like i i knew that was beyond me is just Mm -hmm. like a moment that i felt like when i'm when I'm on my deathbed and talking about the the scenes I'm most proud of, I knew that was going to be on there. And it's been hard because people have been, because I haven't had a spoiler discussion about the book, but when I've been talking about the book, it's like, I don't want to give it away to people, 
you know right <laughs> um but god damn yeah that's my that that in the scene with alice in the eagle's nest are probably my two favorite yeah mm-hmm. because yeah, and and for that the alice scene because it gets the concept and the and the sheer revenge of it all for for the scene with himmler but um yeah and then i you know and i do like the scene with because you know one of the tropes of this is you got to have the scene where you you get the mission right and Mm -hmm. um the scene where they get the mission and some of the dialogue in that i'm i'm really proud of because the dialogue has to be great and and you know the line the last night to kill nazis is 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 word for word in there and then the concept that you know that these guys see like you know from the beginning to me like the idea was how awesome it would be to have them basically have this moment where they're like you know they're gonna surrender any minute and once (laughs) they surrender there's gonna be trials and they're gonna say hitler made me do it we were following orders yeah so from the beginning part of the idea of it was this idea that they were like we have to kill as many nazis as we can right now because this is our time this is the last night we can do it and you know so it's funny because people will say to me you know what do you mean the last night can't we kill nazis now like i'm like well yes (laughs) you could (laughs) you're overthinking the concept here but (laughs) right right uh, we right yeah and obviously it's like within the context of the war and those things and and you know and then there's moments too where noah's like looking at the sun coming up and being like yeah this is the last sun sunrise for the reich and you know just when you really think about like what it was like to be there on that day and to mm-hmm. be in the middle of all this swirling maelstrom it's it's like it's heavy gravity shit. the gravity of it yeah it's huge yeah yeah and it's fun to do a horror novel in it <laughs> oh yeah yeah and i like that people will think it's just a b movie like killing nazi fest and that they're gonna get something more yeah yeah i'd like deep uh like uh, dives into the personal psyche of someone's own evil and coming to terms with it is just found, you know, just littered throughout the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, it's funny too, because you know this, Des, that I really wanted to transition to writing more science fiction. And right. um, that was really the the plan. And uh, I didn't mean to write another horror novel or another <laughs> vampire novel, but it just it happened. Just- <laughs> yeah but this this idea was just too good and i just like i couldn't like from the moment i had it like it was like it's funny too because you know carrie deals with like i have idea i literally have like notebooks and notebooks and notebooks of ideas and i have not enough like people when people talk about writer's blog i i can't even understand that because i like i've got like probably 70 novels i would love to write but no one's no one's you know, knocking down my door for them and right. uh, like i have outlines for for years and including all the sequels to this and then um <laughs> you know and so for me to just throw everything all the plans aside and say like no i gotta do this one i i knew what i had you know yeah perfect yeah all right any anything else Here's your well, moment. You can ask unprocessed. What do you think, Des? Yeah, I don't. I, I'm trying to think if I have any other questions. I mean, I think we should just reiterate: go buy the fucking book. Buy the fucking book. <laughs> it's really good. Look, it's vampires. <laughs> it's killing Nazis. What the fuck else do you want? Yeah, <laughs> it's it's like you know, it's like the vampire is just like a nice touch added to it. <laughs> I'd still like this book without a vampire, frankly. <laughs> same here, honestly, same here. No, no rules. No rules. Yeah, yeah, great, um, let's talk great hero. Yeah, you know, well, you hero. know, that does bring up one thing too, is that I did want it to function without the vampire, where like right. I wanted it to function as a World War II mission novel that that if the vampire wasn't there, you'd be okay. Yeah. You know, that you'd still like um have uh a, a, a you know a compelling story and mission that you could follow along, be excited by, and you know, and, mm-hmm. and enjoy. And and you know yeah yeah i i'm i'm proud of those details too and uh and 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 joel kicked ass on the artwork too cool cover yeah yeah Yeah. all that cover rules 
Yeah. And um, it was it was funny because I just sent him a whole bunch of like Alistair McLean novels. OK, all right, cool. Right. I sent him a bunch of those. <laughs> and then I was like. like uh, Cross of Iron or whatever. Yeah. And I said, <laughs> um, make the vampire a partisan, um, <laughs> which is funny because he doesn't ever wear partisan gear or anything. Right. In the book. Right. But if you know, that's a deep that's an Easter egg for the region that he comes from because that's a partisan. That's the, the uniform that the partisan fighters who fought against the Nazis in Romania wore. Right. Okay, and cool. So um, even though he doesn't wear that actually in, in the book, but um, and Joel and I talked because we had a bunch of different ideas and I was like, yeah, I, I know he's not in the book, but I think he should be in a partisan uniform <laughs> on the book. And um, it'll make me happy. And then we all like Christoph and Joel and I all agree. Yeah. yeah. And Perfect. His, his hands look great too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. And hopefully we'll get to do uh, the Noah Gremlin uh, novel in the, the Pacific theater. And you know, what's funny is that um, I have a whole outline for a, a, a world war two mission novel set in the pacific theater with that has no supernatural elements at all it's just a story. oh yeah world war ii novel about um uh, interned um japanese uh people who get recruited for a undercover mission and um again i am not sure if i'm the person who can write that but i have i have it I have it outlined and uh, someday I would love, I'd love to write that. But um, did you ever watch season two of the terror? Uh, you know, I haven't, but I've read Elma. You know, one thing that slowed me was Elma Katsu's novel about um, the internment camps. Uh, was uh, okay. so good. And, yeah. um, and then I was like, you know, I feel like she did such a great job and I'm going to feel kind of weak coming in. After right. this, I have not seen season two of the terror. I'm I'm kind of turned off by the whole Dan Simmons of it all, but even though yeah, I know he had fair. absolutely nothing to do with the second season. Yeah. The, yeah, fir I, the, I, the I, first I, season is fantastic. The second season is okay. I thought it was I thought it was pretty good. I think maybe maybe a little over long, but I think I feel that way about pretty much most TV shows. Yeah. Well, and yeah. Well, I'm I'm in science fiction land right now. So um I'm uh I'm writing a science fiction novel at the moment and um so i don't i i don't know after that one what what i'll be doing but um and then the nonfiction book i just finished so nice that's um, nice the uh unfinished pkd so yeah um, that's yeah, been a hell, hell of an odyssey to get that done hey eh? yeah yeah it's been been cool um i never wrote a nonfiction book before so it took a lot more work <laughs> Because you have to <laughs> footnote everything, and um, but it was one hundred and twenty thousand words. Wow! Um, and partially because I'm quoting a lot of these unfinished outlines and novels, and right. um, and speaking of Nazis, um, like one of the longest chapters is uh, Phil started a sequel to Man in the High Castle, and um, oh okay, because um, what people fail to forget about uh, or fail to realize about Man in the High Castle a lot of times is there's barely any Nazis in it um is because it mostly takes place in japan and he's occupied america right. and he planned a sequel that took place in nazi occupied america called swastika and the cross and the research about the nazis was so uh horrifying to him that he didn't want to finish it he was like you know wow. what fuck these guys i don't want to <laughs> do with them and he wrote and it was interesting too because when I was reading those chapters and looking at that, I was like, "I feel you, Phil. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, no I, shit. I've 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 done it. And and you know that's another motivating factor for writing a book this quick is like then you can get away from these assholes. Um, yeah, you know, and uh, you know that 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 can be a motivator. But it, and Phil never finished Swastika and the Cross because um, you know he. Uh, um, but they did turn um, some of the ideas behind it into the second and third seasons of the TV show. Oh, okay. So yeah, not not entirely faithful, but you'll 
have to read unfinished PK, which you won't, Des, because you don't like <laughs> Philip K. Dix. So <laughs> you got to read three. I, I, I think gotta... I'll I'll grab it just to support you, David. Well, and, and I do love the idea of like just unfinished works being discussed and stuff too. So well, and it gets into formula and process too, and that mm-hmm. that leads to, and I'll say this really quickly before we go, just as a tease for people, but. <laughs> Um, the current book that I am writing um, is inspired by Unfinished PKD because one of the things, there's an entire chapter in Unfinished PKD where in the in 1965, he wrote fellow science fiction writer Ron Goulart yeah. um, a letter um, outlining his formula for, this is how Philip K. Dick writes a novel. This is how he gets 55,000 words every time. And he explained what he does in his first chapter, he explains what he does in his second chapter, explains how this character gets introduced, and that character gets introduced. And once you read the letter, you're like, fuck, he uses that every goddamn time. <laughs> and so I murder boarded 27 Philip K. Dick novels based on the formula. And sometimes he switches it up, like he'll do the chapter two thing first and then the chapter one thing second. Right. Like Ubik, he he flipped them. And but once I saw the formula, it was like, now when I read Philip K. Dick, I'm like the guy in beautiful mind that sees the, <laughs> everything yeah. floating. And so uh, I got challenged by Professor D. Harlan Wilson. He said to me one time offhandedly, he's like, you think you could write a novel using the PKD formula? I mean, you've been studying all of his outlines and you've been re- researching him for five years straight. You think you could write a PKD novel? And uh, in in a moment of hubris, I said, yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, the concept behind the novel I'm writing right now, which is called Great America in Dead World. And the concept Sorry, in, in Dead World. Yes. Great America okay. in Dead World. OK. And the concept was my favorite year that Phil was Phil was writing was 1963. That's when he wrote The Three Sigma of Palmer Eldridge, which is the novel that I think you should read does okay might change your mind on pkd um because it's one of the most horrifying books ever written and one of the weirdest books ever written (laughs) and um during that year he wrote like six books in like a four month period and he was hopped up on speed and so my headcanon for this book is imagining that phil got super hopped up on speed started writing and his typewriter set on fire and then he woke up in 2022 spent a year here and then was like, now I'm going to write a satire about um, the modern world based, you know? And so like, I'm trying to picture Phil okay. writing about our world today. Right. And, um, so it's a kind of a satire of social media, Donald Trump, MAGA, um, climate change, um, just like our modern world. And um, I'm pretty proud of it. It's, and it's weird because I've never written a book, not as myself. Right. And this is not a David Agronoff book at all. It right. is nothing like my books. It is. Um, and Phil, sometimes, you know, he had this formula, but he also wrote Man in the High Castle from the seat of his pants. So like, and there's bits and pieces of the formula in it, but he sometimes would just, and then a lot of times like Ubik, he started with an outline and then just after two chapters was like, fuck it, I'm doing something else. Right. And so a lot of his bad habits I'm using, (laughs) for example, like uh, Phil, like always does intense world building in the first two chapters and then forgets about a lot of it. (laughs) Okay. And so I'm intentionally forgetting about a lot of it. (laughs) Um, All right. I'm doing intense world building in the first two chapters (laughs) and then dialing it back later on purpose. I'm having, he's making, I'm making choices in the book. I would never make, but Phil would make. (laughs) I'm like every once in a while, I'll write a sentence and be like, Phil would never say that, but I'm going to keep it anyways. Like I had a character describe somebody as an asshole's idea of a fuck face, (laughs) (laughs) but it was too good. So I left it there. And um, so idea, uh, asshole's idea of a fuck face is still in (laughs) And then, um, but for example, there's a third, Phil always, after the story should have ended, 
there's almost always like two chapters where it goes on some crazy wild idea that has nothing to do with anything else. <laughs> okay. We have a joke on our podcast about Phil where we're like, we're always like, oh, again, it should have ended on that <laughs> chapter, but then it goes to this weird. So this novel has this totally random, just completely out there idea that kind of sort of connects to the novel, but that where it's going to go in the, in the final act, if I get there, I'm only 23,000 words into it so far, but, okay. um, but I'm having a lot of fun writing it because it. it's really weird writing to somebody else. I've never done that before. And it's a really kind of a surreal experience. And I couldn't have done it if I didn't spend the last five years, like, right. Like nerdy. buried in his work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I have now read everything that he wrote when he was a, or everything that he published when he was alive. And so now I've only got through the podcast, like five or six of his post humorous books to read. Hmm. And, okay. um, and then, um, and then we'll be done with the original mission. So, nice. and on that note, wow. I got to be boring the fuck out of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, man. Yeah. All good. Uh, any last, last I've, thing? I think I got to, I think I got to wrap up myself actually. So, yeah, let's get on with this. So, yeah. um, all right, folks, um, I'll I'll sign us out because it, fuck, it's my podcast. Des, you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, uh, you should all listen to Des's podcast, Dread Media. And um, I, you know, I love your podcast, but a lot of times I can't ke- keep up with the movies, and I don't like what listening when I don't know the movies ahead of time. I get that. So I don't listen as much as I used to because I can't keep up with as many movies as you cover. That's entirely fair. It's but entirely fair. Do an awesome job with that show, and people haven't heard it. And I'm proud to say I was the first interview on Dread Media. That's right. You you were you were the first interview for the Dread Media as it was a segment on another podcast. Which is yes. Even before Dread Media, you're and you're the first person. Now? How many episodes? um tomorrow 841 comes out <laughs> 841 straight weeks so zach you gotta go where do we find your books you will find um anywhere books are sold amazon barnes and noble hungers as old as this land uh the long shalom and hopefully more to come soon Hell yeah. yeah um long shalom is sitting on my tbr it will be read in the i i just my tbr is insane it's, it's, <laughs> mine too yes getting there i, I keep oh, adding to mine too library books because the library books come in and i can't do anything i can't you, you can't gotta read them first those. you gotta yeah. read those <laughs> you gotta read those or they gotta be returned so when the yeah. library books come in it fucks up everything and <laughs> so i just took a break from the library books read suborbital seven um john shirley automatically gets to the top yeah um and uh yeah so on well, that Hopefully I'll have something for you to read as well. And sometime soon. Ooh, yeah. Well, uh, and for those who don't know, Des uh, wrote uh, a superhero novel that I'm a big fan of. Did you do another draft of that or is this something new, new? Uh, well, it's been drafted since, since you read it. Okay. Yeah. So it's mostly done, but I'm, I'm going to, I'm going back and doing a little bit with it. Nice. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, folks, uh, if you're nerd enough to have made it this far, you're fucking <laughs> uh, must have really liked this book. And uh, <laughs> tell other people, write reviews. We want more Noah adventures. Hell yeah. Want Hell the yeah. Noah gremlin in the <laughs> plane book. We want the Noah haunted mansion in the French resistance. Yeah. And the, and the mummies. And the mummies in North Africa, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Yeah, Help definitely a spin on Five Graves to Cairo. <laughs> Saying, dope. And uh, <laughs> the other thing you could do with this book is that I did it. We did a series on this podcast covering World War II movies that inspired this one. So you can go back and listen to those. There's little Easter eggs for last night's for Nazis in there too. So and, and I'm and I'm so behind on podcasts that I just listened to those. So oh <laughs> well you know I'm just glad you're listening, Des. I'm just glad you're listening. I'm and, listening. Uh, on that Always. note, uh happy 71st birthday to our boy Clive Barker. Hell yeah. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. The king. 
Yeah. And uh, uh, we'll talk to everybody again soon.